Later on tonight at 12.45, Peter Sellers plays an ageing and philandering general, faced with the awkward situation of hiding his old flame from his nagging wife in Waltz of the Toreadors. All right, Harry. When a stump rabbit is murdered, Lazarus and Dingwall are sent on the case. That was the film of Dwayne Blake allegedly committing the alleged murder. Good job they had the alleged camera there. Yes. We'd like to ask a few questions, nothing to worry about, it's just routine. Fire away. It's metaphorical, see. I meant it metaphorically. The Really Serious Crime Squad, tonight at 9 on 2. In 15 minutes, in a change to the published programme, Public Eye looks at the, di the dilemma caused by the proposed deportation of Iraqis and Palestinians from Britain. First on BBC Two, Julian Nundy of The Independent on Sunday looks back at the week's events that have been making the headlines. What the papers say. IRA scuds, 40 feet from killing cabinet. The war on our doorstep. They will not win. This week, what the papers say is presented by Julian Nundy at the Independent on Sunday. Good evening. At least the IRA attack on 10 Downing Street has spared the inevitable press response to the merest blizzard. White hell covers Britain. For once, the sun had the worst front page picture and couldn't find a headline to go with it. But it did give any further IRA attackers a most helpful guide to the inside of number 10. It even headed it... Sitting targets. Today, under its headline... War on 10 Downing Street. Cabinet dived under table. Took the opportunity for some neat self-advertisement in the matter of cabinet reading. A copy of today in front of Norman Lamont. If authentic, it could explain our problems. The Times, describing the manufacture of IRA mortar bombs, said the attack failed because of a pinch too many. Too much sugar in recipe for death. An extra pinch of sugar added... For luck to the explosive charge that sent homemade mortar bombs hurtling over Whitehall towards Downing Street may have saved the lives of the war cabinet. If you're fed up with tales of terrorism, bombardment and devastation in the Middle East, take heart. Our tabloids have been fighting for some brighter angles. And is Gulf War. The Sun, we back our heroes, decided there was something quite unheroic about the naval officer Prince Andrew playing golf in Spain, where his ship was on a courtesy visit. As war rages in the Gulf, the only bunker he's seen is at the lovely new course in Spain. His outing ignored the Queen's ban on royals having fun during the Gulf War, which includes Prince Charles having to give up his fox hunting. It's an ill wind. While the forces were crouching in trenches in the Saudi desert, the prince was chipping out of sandy bunkers on an 18-hole round with three officer pals. Someone who's been spending rather more time in the other sort of bunker is General Norman Schwarzkopf, the American commander of Allied troops in the Gulf. But does he remind you of anyone? The people thinks he should do. When Stormin' Norman looked like Gaza. I wondered how we're going to get Gaza into the Gulf coverage. This is Stormin' Norman Schwarzkopf, the general destined to lock horns with Saddam Hussein in the desert, when he looked like Gaza, and the only butcher he knew was the man who cut his hair. The picture dates from 1955, when Stormin' Norman was a West Point cadet. If the general could only turn tearful at one of his briefings, then we would know that they are related. Such important issues aside, other coverage of the Gulf War honed in on what the conflict is doing to the English language. Finial Asherson of The Independent on Sunday. Language is going mad and judgment has dived underground for cover. In the last few days, public comment and description have exploded into flying fragments of plastic war speak. Thrusts and killer punches are blitzed, devastated, crushed as... Cowardly. Iraqis make... Treacherous. Attacks. Why does war have to be performed in dialect? As if it were a rite that must be performed in Latin or Old Slavonic. For the Daily Telegraph, it was a question of... War speak attack. Is English, as she is spoke, going up in smoke? It must be clear to anyone who's followed the television presentation of the Gulf War that whatever may have been its first casualty, the English language has been its second. The Telegraph took exception to distorted usage and creeping Americanisms. It described one American expert talking to an interviewer about Iraq's Scud missiles. Neither batted an eyelid when, in mentioning the Iraqi capability of dealing with Patriot missiles, the expert ruled out the possibility of any Iraqi anti-anti-missile missile missiles. They were probably too busy watching out for them. For those suffering from terminal confusion caused by military newspeak, the Sunday Times published the A to Z of war speak. Or should that be A to Z? It contains such comforting expressions as HRP, human remains pouch, 
body bag. The sun had its own version, specifically designed to help us understand our American cousins in the desert. Wrap the tango like a switched on cookie. Translation? Learn to talk like a good GI. The sun outlined its mission as a desire to lift... The lid on grunt speak, the hilarious new slang used by US troops in the Saudi desert. It contained such hilarity as... Elvis, dead. Fun aside, some of the tabloids seem to be becoming a little less gung-ho in their approach to the war and a little more sensitive to the victims on the other side. After the battle to free the Saudi town of Hafchi, both the Daily Mirror and the Daily Star carried the same photograph of a dead Iraqi soldier, and their headlines revealed a sympathy for the young man's plight. Cannon fodder. Sacrifice for Saddam. Until then, of course, much of the war coverage had come in endless repetition of military communiques and speculation about the next phase, nearly all of it shrouded in the incomprehensible vocabulary of our new military celebrities. The whole thing was a recipe for infighting amongst the media. The Daily Express opened a second front and laid into its rivals. Beware media's fifth columnists. Some left-wing media stars challenge every Allied statement, yet give Saddam and his claims the benefit of the doubt. And despite the obvious successes of the Allies, some broadcasters and journalists seem determined to put the most discouraging gloss on events. Should they then be putting an optimistic gloss on events? These defeatists had their finest hour when they were able to depict the short-lived Iraqi takeover of Hafji as an Allied setback and a great propaganda victory for Saddam. In truth, it was a military irrelevance and the recapture a morale boost for the Saudis with troops in the forefront. Max Hastings in the Daily Telegraph accused other journalists of competing with each other for bad news. It is no exaggeration to suggest that the litmus test for a reporter to win plaudits from his peers so far in this conflict is to outdo the competition in expressions of disbelief about official Allied claims. Robert Fisk of The Independent attacked colleagues for a cosy relationship with the military. How are we going to justify what amounts to sycophancy if the forthcoming land battle turns into a bloodbath for the West? What excuses will we find for those uncritical reports? Derek Mercer in The Guardian questioned British information policy. The MOD's unattributable briefings have played a key role in setting the tone of coverage in Britain. Although their gloomy assessments, six days into the war, were more discernible on TV and in the more serious newspapers than the tabloids. So, are the Daily Express's defeatists really Major Generals and Air Vice Marshals? Deception has been part of warfare since the Trojan horse. And if it saves lives, military men will think it justified. But which is the disinformation, the early claims of success or later pessimism? Much of the malaise stems from the fear that we, that is the Allies, haven't seen anything yet in terms of death and destruction on our own side. As Philip Stevens of the Financial Times put it after spending two weeks with British troops in the desert, The media, captivated by the high-tech wizardry of laser-guided bombs, stealth fighters and Patriot missiles, have turned that phase of the war into a sanitised and elaborate computer game. As the skirmishes during the past few days have shown, the ground fighting will not be like that. It will involve men burning in their tanks, being shot, bayoneted blown up. The daily alarms which send the soldiers scurrying for their stifling and cumbersome chemical warfare suits provide a constant reminder too of Mr. Saddam's promise to use nerve and blister gases. It is a terrifying prospect. There was room for a boy's own version of the war which came the way of Richard Dowden of The Independent, who reported yesterday that he had found himself accepting the surrender of four Iraqi soldiers, an escapade worthy of the best Evelyn war. Iraqi deserters tell a bombing nightmare. Four men who walked out of the minefields. Two of them held up little sheets of white paper, like labels, and we knew at once they were Iraqis trying to surrender. Such stuff must have made some tabloid editors salivate with envy, but at the sun, they could comfort themselves with the knowledge that no one in the quality papers had stolen their best idea. Knit your hero a willy warmer! Worried about what it called frozen assets in the cold desert night, the sun gave a pattern for knitting enthusiasts to make up. It was accompanied by some impressive war poetry. When desert nights turn chilly and frost bites willy-nilly, our boys know they can always trust the sun. Silly willies. If truth is the first casualty of this war and the English language the second, then the third casualty would seem to be all other news. President de Klerk announced the abolition of the last apartheid laws, but it was not the press's fault if this did not grab public attention as once it might have. The saturation of dramatic information that we have endured over the past weeks and months just makes it all the more difficult to absorb anything new. The Independent described it this way. Apartheid to be abolished. Seeking to bury the past and rush headlong into the future, President F.W. de Klerk of South Africa committed himself yesterday to scrapping the three remaining pillars of apartheid legislation. 
Not much understatement there. The Times called an editorial for sanctions to go. The ostracism of South Africa over the past two decades left it in comparative peace by third world standards to seek its own political salvation. Nothing is more absurd than for foreigners to claim any credit for Mr. de Klerk's reforms. But the case is overwhelming for the world, and especially the US, to offer sympathy and help as the country enters a delicate period of its history. Advocates of sanctions must have bile in their hearts to continue with their campaign. They are now the true enemies of peace. Tucked away in the any other business sections of this week's papers was the spectre of a general election just before the summer. According to political commentators, if the Gulf War goes well, if John Major continues to enjoy a good standing in the polls, then the temptation to go to the country before we start to count the cost will be all too great. In The Observer, Alan Watkins said, Now the Tory talk is of a khaki election. Why, the backbenchers ask, not exploit the goodwill while it is still there. It will not last. By the autumn, the economy will look even more fragile than it does today. For Norman McRae in the Sunday Times, not going to the polls could be disastrous for the Tories. Tory chances could explode in the economic minefield. The Conservatives look likely to win a... We stopped Saddam! ...election this summer. They don't deserve it. The economic recession is far worse than they said, or still say. As Richard Littlejohn in The Sun asked... Can Stormy Norm save Major John? ...and came to the conclusion that he couldn't. The Daily Express hammered home the same theme. Tory MPs are grasping at the war because they're nervous about the longer-term economic outlook, the poll tax reform difficulties, and not least, the new Premier's capacity to inspire the nation with his vision for the 90s. Happily, there are some steady hands on the helm in Fleet Street, and Gulf Wars, the end of apartheid, and the prospects of the hurly-burly of an election campaign did not distract the more sophisticated of our opinion formers. Exclusive after exclusive informed us of the troubled marriage of Viscount Altrop, brother of the Princess of Wales, and also, remember, a journalist himself. It was all about a one-night stand with a former girlfriend. The Daily Mail fired first. Exclusive. Altrop tells of nights with writer. The Sundays were quick to follow. World exclusive on Royal Fling. Di's brother used me as his sex toy. It is over. Sobs Di's sister-in-law. And on the third day in Game the Sun. We back our heroes. With... I forgive him. Another Royal exclusive. But today lag behind with old news. Die fights to rescue brother's marriage. But where would we really be without our tabloids? After all, if they didn't report such news, our serious papers would have a hell of a job trying to get similar stuff into print. Mercifully, the popular press gives them the chance to observe from on high and tut-tut along. The Sunday Times, for example, gave the affair as much space as any good tabloid could. Confessions of a Viscount who scooped a snoop. The Independent also gave it a good spread and cemented its respectability with a review of a study of adultery published by the Oxford University Press. Price of public betrayal slumps, the changing balance and extramarital relationships. According to the Sunday Times, Viscount Altrop was approached by a News of the World reporter asking him for confirmation of details of his private life. He had to think quickly. The paper noted that he had not even enjoyed his one-night stand. He decided to get his version of events into the public arena first. He would, he decided, take the sting out of it by telling the truth as honestly as he could and apologise publicly for it. The other half of the affair, Sally Ann Lasson, a cartoonist who also works in newspapers, had sold her story to the news of the world. So Viscount Altrop called... His old friend, the Daily Mail gossip columnist, Nigel Dempster. Was he interested in a story and would it make sense to reveal all on his own terms? Dempster was delighted to help an old pal and to get a hot royal scoop into the bargain. The manoeuvre failed, the Sunday Times said, as other tabloids moved in to write their own versions. If Altrop had stayed quiet, the story might never have been published. But the news of the world's doubts was swept away when it saw Altrop's preemptive confession spread across the front page of the Mail. He had personally provided it with the corroboration it needed. Whatever personal distress this all may have caused, it did give Fleet Street an opportunity to moralise. And in the Daily Express, Jean Rook... The First Lady of Fleet Street... ...with her Diamante charm, took the chance to recall the Altrop's wedding day 18 months ago. The bags under the morose groom's eyes drooped lower than his bulldog jowls. Anne Boleyn, on her way to the scaffold, looked more lively than either of them. Richard Littlejohn in the Sun took the opportunity to draw an important social lesson. Upper crust bimbo, Sally Ann Lassen slept with Princess Di's brother, Viscount Altrop. She decided to flog her kiss and sell memoirs to the news of the world. That is her prerogative and Champagne Charlie's hard luck. Champagne Charlie should have known better, it seems. Little John looked back to the golden age of roistering bucks. Aristocrats have always made ample use of mistresses and high-class call girls with whom discretion is assured. The Daily Star noted that... Charlie Altrop, brother of our next queen, Princess Di, is not short of the odd million or two. All inherited, of course. Of course. Now Lord Champagne Charlie shamefacedly confesses to an affair just months after his wedding. As the saying goes... It's the rich what gets the pleasure. And Fleet Street didn't enjoy it at all. 
as Storm in Norma would say, that's bovine scatology. Good night. Norman holds me close to him. Norman kisses me in bed. Norman knows my heart belongs to him and him and only him. Oh, Norman, ooh, Norman, ooh, Norman, Norman, my love. In half an hour, David Stevens compares the great English landscape gardens at Stowe in Buckinghamshire with more humble sites in Gardens by Design. First on BBC Two, in a change to the published edition, this week's Public Eye, introduced by Peter Taylor. <laughs>